Hi, I'm Sean Bonner, and I am a collector. This is something that I've only recently come to terms with, um, although the evidence uh, has been piling up my whole life. Um, I have these huge boxes of things around my house um, that through different cycles and different, different times of my life I've been obsessed with and done research on and, and piled them up and then gotten bored with them and stuck them someplace else or sold them off to buy the next things that I was interested in. And uh, I have a very complicated relationship with, with stuff, it turns out. I, I'd really hate having it around, I feel cluttered, uh, but then as soon as I clear a space, I'm like, oh, I need something to go there. And so um, then I start researching and, and finding new stuff to stick in, stick in that spot. But it turns out that, that when I look at this, what, what, what's exciting is not really the stuff, it's the thrill of hunting for it. And so the thrill of the hunt is what um, I've realized just this year mostly, is what, what really gets, gets me excited and helps me find stuff. And there's a few things that make, make that possible. So whatever this object is, I have to be able to know everything about it. It can't be something infinite like wine or that's continuing to grow or whatever. I have to, it has to be a finite amount of information that I can learn the entire thing from start to finish. The stuff that was made, I have to be able to get it. So it can't, it can't be stuff that maybe they made two or three of, it's out in the world, I have no chance of ever getting it. It has to be mass produced enough that I can actually track it down and I can complete this collection. And then it, also it can't be something like Ferraris because there's no way I have that kind of expendable income. So um, the absolute top tier of whatever this thing is has to sort of be in my reach plausibly, even if I don't actually go for it. And then if I'm really honest, um, if, if all my friends are into it and I go to their house and everybody has the same stuff around, then it's boring and, and I don't get excited about it anymore. So all those things come together and then I end up finding stuff that I have to research. This is my kid and um, he's in awe of the exciting world around him. And so in my efforts to constantly blow his mind, um, I pulled out my record collection and started playing him records, mostly because I wanted him to hear hear different songs and music and stuff, but you know, it also, the, the physical aspect of playing records turned out to be pretty cool. But I, I let him loose on it, and I said, you just pick stuff, go through it and find stuff. And he starts picking stuff not by context or, or by genre, but just by record covers. And, uh, and he ended up picking out a lot, of, a lot of jazz records that I had around just by covers, which isn't, isn't really surprising because that's actually how I got these records myself too. I would go to a record store and I was, I was struck by these amazing covers and I would say, hey, I wanna grab these. And so he's playing them, I'm looking at them again and then you know, I, started, I started doing research. And it turns out that um, Blue Note jazz records are an incredibly huge black hole for collector nerds. And um, I fell into it earlier this year. I forget what my next slide is. <laughs> yeah, can we just leave that one on forever? <laughs> okay, so um, <laughs> for any uh, for any record that Blue Note released, there there's probably 30 different versions of it, and and they sort of took the. Uh, let's just copy a VHS tape a hundred times approach to it. So every version that they released is worse than the one before it. So people want to get the early versions, not because they want, oh, I got the first, but because it actually sounds way better than the stuff they made later. Sometimes they would just took a cast of a record and then use that to make masters of them. But any, any Blue Note record that you pick up, there's like 20 different things that can all vary at any different point to tell you exactly what year that record was made. And then you can sort of look up to figure out like what, what the sound quality on it's going to be. And so the early stuff, very desirable, but even the Holy Grail of this stuff, the very first pressings from early 60s of, of some of this stuff, um, you can still track it down and it's still sort of within reach, so it's not like you need to um, you know, sell your car or mortgage your house or anything if, if that's what you are going to do. Not that I'm going to do that, but if you are. Um, but I also found this weird little black hole, or this little loophole in this, in that Blue Note licensed out their stuff to other countries to make. And in Japan, they were incredibly anal about it and they wouldn't take any of the existing masters and they made their own masters off of original tapes. And so the Japanese pressings actually sound way better than any of the US pressings past a certain date. Of course, there's also a bunch of versions for the Japanese pressings and similar things happened. But that ends up making 
um, things like this incredibly uh, exciting for me and I can lose a whole afternoon um, stumbling across one of these places now hoping to find one of these little gems. And then that made me try to figure out why is this so exciting to me and this, this little bit of research, why am I all obsessed about it now? And that's how I came up with these four things and, and it seemed, this seems to hit on them. And um, so if anybody has any old jazz records around, um, you should give them to me. Thanks.